Welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about molecular geometry and molecule shapes. Um, that's going to stem from what we call the Vesper theory. And so the Vesper theory is the thing that kind of governs the shapes that molecules make. So from our molecule modeling lab that we did, um, one of the things that you saw in that is that, yes, it kind of resembles the Lewis dot structure, but in the Lewis dot structure, we're working in 2D, and in the molecule modeling, you really started to see what these three-dimensional shapes um, started to look like. And one of the things that you should have noticed is that there were certain shapes that um, were made kind of over and over and over again, and it didn't really matter necessarily what elements included in them, but if there were certain combinations of um, things that it always made the same shape. So today what we're going to look at is what are those combinations that make those same shapes? And then you'll start seeing what are the elements that make those certain combinations. So to start out, we're going to talk about what Vesper is and kind of where that theory comes from. So um, Vesper stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for valence, shell, electron, pair, repulsion, theory. So the Vesper theory is the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And so what this does for us is this explains um, that these valence electrons, when they're paired together, we've talked pretty extensively about how those electrons need to be paired. Um, but we also remember back from when we did electron configurations, Hund's rule says that we're going to evenly distribute before we pair, and that um, that also ends up combined with poly, explaining why even though those pairs are able to coexist as both negative charges, they're also, Vesper says, Vesper adds the piece to it saying that they're going to spread themselves out from each other as much as possible. So we're going to be exploring that piece of it. So Vesper, as a result of spreading out as much as possible, is going to predict the shape of common covalent compounds. Now the shape is going to mean that we're going to have certain angles between, so you have your central atom, and then we're going to have certain angles that each of our outer atoms are at, and this is where the geometry of a molecule comes in, and that geometry depends upon what that molecular shape is. So Vesper says that the electrons are going to spread themselves out as much as possible, and that's going to make our shape. And then the shape that we make based on that is going to determine the geometry, so determine the angles between each of those atoms. So we have to make a couple of assumptions about bonding um, in order for this to kind of all be true and for it to work out. So these are really where our rules from bonding come from. So we're kind of backing into proving or explaining why our rules exist the way that they do. So we know already that atoms in a molecule are bound together by electron pairs that we call bonds, right? And this is when we used our line that represents, remember that represents two electrons, and that when we have more than one set of bonding pairs of electrons, we bind any two atoms together using those, we can end up with a double or a triple bond sometimes as well. And then on top of that, some atoms may also, like we've seen with nitrogen and phosphorus especially, might have these extra pairs of electrons that are unbonded, so they're unshared or unbonded, and those are the ones, especially on the central atom, that we call lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. Okay, so lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. 
Now those lone pairs, this is the key right here. The lone pairs in the outer atoms, which we've practiced counting. We haven't told you why we've been practicing counting that so far, but we've been practicing counting those and recognizing them. They're going to arrange themselves to um, space out all those negative electrons evenly as possible. And so therefore they're going to move as far as possible from each other. So around that central atom, each of your lone pairs and each of your outer atoms are going to spread themselves out as far as possible. And that is what makes the shape that we see when we make that molecule. So we're going to scroll down here just a little bit more and we're going to talk about which shapes we're going to focus on. Okay. And how to determine that. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to determine, whoops, excuse me. We're going to determine the number of valence electrons that are unbonded. And then we're going to find the number of valence electrons that are bonded to the central atom. Okay, so basically what this leads us to is to determining um, how many outer atoms that we have and how many lone pairs that we have. So the big key right here is that your Lewis dot structure tells you this. Okay, so we have to draw the Lewis dot structure first to be able to easily identify the number of valence electrons that are unbonded, so our lone pairs, and then the number of valence electrons that are bonded, thus indicating our outer atoms, and all of that is connected to that central atom. So we look at the whole reason for doing the Lewis dot structures is because we look at that to determine how many lone pairs do we have and how many outer atoms do we have. So then, after that, we're going to determine the overall shape by looking at the distribution not sure why that's writing it below the line, sorry about that. That should go right there. The distribution um, of the electron pairs both bonded and lone. Okay, again, not sure why it's writing underneath the line like that. Sorry about that. Okay, so again, we count our outer atoms and our lone pairs based on our Lewis dot structure, and then we're going to look at how is that going to cause the distribution around the central atom based on those bonded and lone pairs. So scrolling up, these are the shapes that we're going to focus on. So again, these are the shapes that we're going to focus on. The very first one is called linear. The next one is called bent. The third one is called trigonal planar. And then this fourth one is trigonal here in middle. And then this one is called tetrahedral. So the next thing that we're going to do is look at each of the orientations that each of them has. I'm going to fill in this last one. And we're going to look at the combination of outer atoms and lone pairs that each of them has. So on this one, we have linear. Now linear is a little bit tricky because linear can happen with a central atom or it can happen without a central atom. 
this picture is showing it with a central atom. So on this one, we have our central atom and we have two outer atoms. And then the fact that it's linear is indicating that there are zero lone pairs. So you'll start to see a trend there. On bent, we also have two outer atoms, but notice that it's not straight out. The two outer atoms are kind of flexed downward. And the reason for that is because we also have two lone pairs that are located here and here that we can see from the Lewis dot structure. So remember, we're using our Lewis dot structure in combination with looking at the shapes to determine all of this information. Trigonal planar, again, is flat. Plane means flat. And so we can predict then that it has no uh, lone pairs. And in, in fact, it doesn't. So it's got three outer atoms and no lone pairs. And then for trigonal pyramidal, notice that it's kind of standing on its legs. All of these outer atoms are flexed downward again. And sure enough, it has a lone pair. Tetrahedral is all evenly spread around the central atom. It's got four outer atoms that are all evenly spread. And so that would indicate that we do not have any lone pairs. So basically what you're looking at here is you're looking at your number of outer atoms. And then for each of them, you have a situation where you don't have lone pairs and you have a situation where you do have lone pairs. And the pattern is that when you don't have lone pairs, things are flat. When you do have lone pairs, things are flexed downward. Now on the tetrahedral, we do not have lone pairs, but we also have things that are flexed. But you can see that we have this fourth leg that is standing up evenly in the opposite direction as everything else. And we could stand this tetrahedral molecule on each of the three different legs that it could stand on. So we could change the combination of three legs that we're standing on and it would work and it would look exactly the same no matter which three legs we stood it on. So we really see that, that it's very evenly distributed and that's because there's no lone pairs to flex things in um, all in one direction. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a break and we're gonna practice counting lone pairs and um, outer atoms and identifying shape and then we'll come back and we'll talk about some of the implications of that.